Now we'll have the uh, first scripture reading from Luke chapter uh, 4, verses 1 to 13. This we will do in unison. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. So good morning. Zachary, your grandma outed you. She told me you were going to be here. But you can, you can hang out where you are. And my first question is, what is your favorite food? What's your favorite thing to eat? Could be a dessert. Could be candy. It's hard to choose. Give me one or two. What's your favorite dessert? Ice cream sandwich. <laughs> Janet approves. Yeah, really good. So have you ever had so much of something that later, like to eat, that you feel yucky later? A giant chocolate bar. That happens to me. I, I, have, to, I have to, like, when I eat chocolate, I can only have so much because if I have too much, then you feel ugh later on, right? It's actually a blessing uh, if you can get to where, if you're one of those people, and not everybody is like this, that you know that if I have too much of that, I'm going to feel yucky, so I'm not going to overdo it. It doesn't happen for everybody, but it's one of those things that from your experience, you know, okay, I can only have this much and not that much, right? So I was thinking about, you know, learning, in the story you have Jesus who doesn't have anything to eat, right? And he's being tempted to, to turn a stone into bread for him to eat. And he chooses not to and says you have to live by the word alone. And the whole sense of choosing what is the right thing to do, being tempted to do the wrong thing. And I was thinking of this story um, from when I was a kid. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Is she older or younger than you? She's three years old? Okay, so you're the older. All right, so I was, I was the younger child. I have one sister who's a year and a half older than me, although now she looks seven years younger, but that is what it is, right? <laughs> so when we were little, she, I, she was bigger than me, and there's a big age difference between you and your sister, but she was bigger than me, so she, could always, she would hit me when she got upset. And I got to be really good because I could never overpower her, but I could cut her into little pieces by the things that came out of my mouth. I can't be the only one, right? So I was really quick with my tongue, right? And I could, you know, and I could make her, I would say mean things to her. And she wouldn't, she, she didn't think as fast, so she would just boom, right? Or she'd say, that, you're just stupid. And I'm like, oh, is stupid all you can come up with? Only stupid people say stupid. You know, things like that, right? So one time, one time, and I can still remember it, I set her up to get in trouble. 
I'm sure your younger sister will do this to you at some point. But I, I said, younger children, you know, right? I set her up to get in trouble. I'm standing in my bedroom, and I, knew, I said something that was going to upset her. I knew it. And I also knew that she was going to pick up a pillow and throw it, throw it at me, right? So I stood right by a lamp, right? <laughs> and what do you know? She picked up the pillow, threw it at me, knocked over the lamp, and what do I do? And I go out, and there's my dad. He's vacuuming the, the living room. And I said, Heather threw a pillow, and it knocked over the lamp. And he wasn't having it and said, Heather, go to your room. And my sister was so upset because she didn't get to say her side of the story, right? And dad, but she, and I don't want to hear it, go to your room. You never listen to me. And for the first time, I heard my dad lose it. You don't yell at me. Get to your room now. And I heard my, and I'm all in my room. And I hear my sister cry and run to her room. And I'm standing there going, I did this. I did this whole thing. And I never heard my dad yell. And it was like, ah. And you know what? I felt so awful that I thought, oh, I never want to do that again. I have come to the place, and I don't know how I was, I think I was in a teenager, a little older than you, where I realized I do not like feeling guilty. Right? So I would make choices, try to make choices, and I don't always get it right still, but try to make choices so that I know I'm not going to feel guilty later. We're all going to make mistakes, even when we're trying our best, we make mistakes, in Jesus, we know that, that we are forgiven, that Jesus just, you know, hey, hey, try better. You know, we go to Jesus, we say, I'm sorry. Jesus said, okay, try better next time. And that's the rest of our lives. But it's a blessing when we can get to the place of, you know, it's just better to do the right thing, if you know what it is, to choose the right thing so that you don't have to deal with all that guilt. My prayer for you and for all of us is that we get to, that we live in a space where, you know, even, even, if, the t- even if the right thing is the tough thing, I'm going to choose it because I don't want to feel guilty later. Make sense? All right. Let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads and pray. Dear God, I pray for the, the blessing for all of us that we might make the choices that, where we can live with ourselves, where we can look at ourselves in the mirror uh, straight on and be proud of ourselves. Uh, we're, not, you know, we're not always going to make the right decisions, and we know that, and we're grateful that we know in Jesus that we are forgiven. But, Lord, I pray that you'll give each of us the courage and the intelligence to make the right choices. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from James chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's been a lot of talk lately, or in recent years, about the Lord's Prayer. And this is the last in a a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. We are at the last line. Do uh, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. Does God tempt us? Let's look at the choices the translators made. Do you remember there, when I was a kid, there was a sportscaster who would say, let's go to the videotape. Right? I would say, let's go to the Greek. Right? Because, and because I think you're a congregation that appreciates that translators make choices. 
We could say, do not bring us to the time of trial or to temptation or calamity or affliction. Or we could simply pray, please don't test us. And what's being tested? Our faithfulness, our fidelity, our integrity, our virtue, our constancy. I love that word, our constancy. I think we're tested every day. Every day we're cautioned, choose this day whom you will serve, like Joshua. And tomorrow we'll have to make the same choice. And then deliver us. Draw us to yourself. That's, that's the root of that word. Draw us to yourself, like snatch us and hold us close. Rescue us from evil or the evil one. In looking up the possible word choices, I read that the root of the word evil is associated with being toilsome or bad. And I quote, properly pain-ridden, emphasizing the inevitable agonies or misery that always goes with evil. Spare us from the agony of awful choices. Can I hear an amen? (laughs) And we do make them. Everybody has an Achilles heel, borrowing from Greek mythology. The story of Achilles is that his mother, Thetis, dipped him into the river Styx, making him invulnerable except for his heel. But Homer wrote the Iliad and portrays pride as the real, cul- as the real culprit. That was his undoing. Classical theology boils all of our sins down to pride and selfishness. Pride says, nobody tells me what to do. Selfishness says, I'm only going to serve me. Modern theology argues with that a little bit. There are some people who have no self-esteem whatsoever, who you know, can live their lives as a doormat, and to be, you know, to be told that you, know, you need to put your ego to the, you know, to the door or to the, you know, that's already been done. These are the folks who need the gospel for them is God loves you so much. You are precious in God's sight that God would die for you. Uh, so... I want to argue with that, the the traditional theology a little bit, but not too much. I want to go back to the idea that everybody has an Achilles heel. Everybody has something that can be their undoing, that tempts you. And our temptations are different uh, depending on the person. Uh, We all have different things that can be on our, our undoing. And this is a really, I don't, this, somebody said this years ago, and I'm like, yeah. Temptation isn't real unless it really tempts you. You could put a chocolate cake in the middle of the table and and tell me not to eat it. It would go stale. I could care less. Now put fresh peaches with some vanilla ice cream and tell me not to eat it. And I'd go, ooh, be ashamed to let that ice cream melt. Right? We all have different things. And we need to be mindful of that. And when we read the story of Jesus' temptation, we need to remind ourselves, he was truly tempted. These are things that tempted him. He wasn't indifferent to them. Otherwise, it would not have been temptation. Worldly power. Worldly comfort. Freedom from suffering. And it's actually wonderful foreshadowing of what's going to happen at the end of the story. Because, you know, worldly power, and it says king of the Jews while he's hanging, you know, while he's hanging from a cross. Uh, worldly comfort, and we know that, he, you know, he forsakes all of that. He's turned a stone into bread, and then at the end he's breaking the piece of bread and saying, this is my body given for you. And then freedom from suffering, and we see him on a cross. So it's wonderful foreshadowing but those were the temptations for him and probably not that day but every day of his life and we know that Jesus was successful in his calling and resisted from Hebrews we read for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but we have one who in every respect has been tested or attempted as we are yet without sin Here's a fun exercise. If the devil were to take you to the wilderness, what would be the three things to keep you from walking the journey of faith, to be who God created you to be? 
in this world. American culture would promise, I think, fame, fortune, and either good looks or the fairy tale relationship. Every Disney movie when I was a kid. Where churches are tempted, I think this would, might be the top three. Lord, we don't ever want to be afraid. We don't ever want to fail. And please, no conflict. Ever. Which, when you think about it, we cannot all want, even in, 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 in any relationship, you can't want the same things all the time. So there's, conflict is completely normal and natural to any relationship, and then as the, the congregation grows, we all have different ideas that we might think is God's will, and we have to figure it out together. What is the thing that can be your undoing? Everybody's got something. And some of you, some of us, are acutely aware of what that thing or those things are because you've had to wrestle down those demons. And again, I would say that that in some ways is a blessing. And as a young person, you know, as I, I look back at being a teenager and say, oh, I would never do that. And then as adult, as an adult, oh, shoot, me too. Some people's sellouts to the devil are, are very obvious and self-destructive. Anybody who succumbs to an, an addiction. Some are socially acceptable. Greed, accumulation of, of money, things, selfishness. Some are less obvious but are still soul-killing. Just think about the story of the, the prodigal son and the older brother. The older brother, he followed all the rules, but man, you know, his, his temptation was to be judgmental, and you're going to grace and mercy for him, for that person? After what? And have we ever thought that about anybody else? So this is one of those sermons where everybody itches a little bit. Everybody squirms in their seat. My mother always says, you know, it's always, every once in a while, it's good to have a good itch sermon. This is one where we all get it. Where we might pray, you know, save me from myself and keep me from self-righteousness. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, because we need it. So does the Lord tempt us? We read in James, no. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. God has created a world where good and evil coexist in the world and within us, and we have the potential for both. And it's good if we never forget that, because it will bring us to our knees, which is always a good place to be, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The disciples live that out in their lives and we live that out in our lives as well. The last line is the point. It's our, it points us to humility. It's the point of this message. We all fall short of the glory of God, and so we need to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you have the power, and I give you the glory. The line is, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever, forever. Amen. We acknowledge that Jesus has the power to save. Jesus has the power to save those who are addicted. Where our own, it's, there's a line in scripture, not, uh, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. There are some things our own, we can will it till the cows come home, but it's only the Spirit of God that can take away that, that desperate need for something that we do not need. There are folks here who can testify. This last line, for thine is the power of the kingdom and the glory, is, it's called the a doxology, a word of praise. It was not in the original manuscripts. And if you notice when we read in, in, in Matthew and Luke, it's, it's not there. 
Why do we say it? When the translators were writing the King James Version, they had a copy in the Greek that maybe a scribe wrote in, in the margin, for thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Uh, amen. And so they included it. Our Catholic brothers and sisters stop if you've ever been in an interfaith and deliver us from evil. And then you can always tell, you know, because <laughs> the Protestants keep going. And then, you know, depending on the, the number of people in the room, you know, you're like, oops, and there's a little looking around, which can be a little awkward. I did a funeral once where the, the, the deceased and, and me were the only Protestants and the rest of the family was Catholic. And I knew when we got to that point and I said, for Frida, for thine is the kingdom, that was her name. I'm like, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Catholic, in the Latin rite, they don't say it. But in the, let me say this correctly, in the Roman rite mass as revised in 1969, the congregation stops and delivers us from evil. And then the priest says a prayer known as the embolism, which reads, deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ which elaborates on the deliver us from evil. And then the people respond with the doxology, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus has the power to save. Amen.